evening, everybody. I've been told by the Veterans Club president that it's 1,900 hours, and we need to get started. I'm Judy Hayes, and I'm the president of the Shalom Club, and I'd like to say what a wonderful turnout this is. So thank you all for being here. For some of you who may not know, the teacher in me is coming out. The word Shalom in Hebrew has many meanings, and one of them is welcome. So, shalom, you all. <laughs> I'd like to welcome all of our Shalom Club and Veterans Club members and give a special thanks to tonight's presenter, Mark Goldberg, for his suggestions in joining both of our clubs together into the, for this presentation, and for Gail Gorenstein, one of the Shalom Club program planners, for making this happen. I'd like to thank Michelle Dale and Dan Murray for their collaborative efforts in advertising this program and making it all possible that you all are here. And most importantly, I want to thank Jan Vollmer and her committee for their wonderful refreshments, and also to Barb Schneider for making sure that everything was done to food safety standards. Next up is Herb Wyman, the president of the Veterans Club. Nobody ever said that talk was too short. So I just want to thank Judy very much, and I'm going to introduce Gail, and we'll get on with the program. From the mic. I'll do it from the mic. This is always a big one. <laughs> I have to say, Mark and I have been emailing each other back and forth for the last couple months. He also did a program for me at Temple Beth Or that I understand you guys are going to love this program. I've only heard the highest praises. So here's, for those of you that don't know Mark, here's a little bit about him. Got to put the glasses on. Um, Mark is a resident of Carolina Arbors. He served for 27 years as a submarine officer in the U.S. Navy. During his career, he was the commanding officer of the attack submarine USS Newport News the Ballistic Missile Submarine USS Alaska, and the Naval Reserve Officer Training Corps at Penn State. We are. Mark will talk about his experience as a Jew serving in the Navy and will highlight some of the famous Jewish Americans who served um, our, in our armed forces. And from what I understand, we need to get his wife here too because she apparently has some great stories too. So, without further ado, Mark, come join us. Well, thanks, Gail. Thanks, Judy. I understand we're being recorded, so if you have any questions, be nice. This program uh, actually started at the end of last year because the Shalom Club had some very interesting things going on. They had Jews in baseball. And then they had Jews in rock and roll. And I thought, well, I've been in the military. I know something about the military, and I'm Jewish, so maybe I could give a talk on that. So I've been working with Gail to set this up. And as she said, she asked me, to, would I speak to the senior luncheon at Temple Beth Or? I said, I'd be delighted. And then when my sister-in-law heard that I was giving this talk, she said, would you give this talk to the men's club breakfast at Temple Beth Shalom? I'd be delighted. But if I get one more speaking invitation, I'm going to have to get an agent, I think. So I wanted to talk about uh, some famous Jews in the military. Um, before I do that, uh, I wanted to give you some background about myself and maybe some of my experiences. Uh, one of the things that I found that was interesting when I talked to the group at uh, Temple Beth Or is there were about 25 there, and there were five or six of them that had served in the military. So I know we have veterans here tonight. We have Jewish people that belong to the Shalom Club. Would you raise your hand if you served in the military and are Jewish? Wow. I'm glad to see I'm not the only one. Okay, good. So if I run out of material, at least I know who to call on. So I joined the Navy in 1969. Uh, you may recall that year. It wasn't a very good year for the military. The war in Vietnam was not going well. Uh, the military was not thought of very highly at all. Uh, soldiers weren't welcomed home with open arms like we do today. They were cursed and, and worse. 
Uh, I got into the Naval Academy out of high school, and one of the questions that I received a lot of times was, the Navy, what kind of job is that for a nice Jewish boy? So as I recall, the hierarchy of jobs for nice Jewish boys was doctor, lawyer, rabbi, take over the family business. And the military was way, way down there. Okay? But it really doesn't make a lot of sense because in actuality, Jews have served in the military in every war that our nation has had since the beginning, since the revolution. And you see the pictures on, on the screen right now. Okay, if you walk the, the American cemetery in Normandy, all those rows and rows of white crosses, there are many stars of David that are in there too. So many Jews participated in the Normandy invasion. And one source that I found said in World War II, over 500,000 Jewish soldiers served. That's a pretty big percentage considering the population. So in World War II, my dad was in the Army. Susie's dad was in the Army. Uh, Susie's dad was a medic and was involved in liberating concentration camps at the end of the war. Uh, my dad turned 18 in May of 1945, so the war was over before he finished his basic training. But they served, and people have served in a lot of times. And if you're driving around South Carolina, you'll see this historical marker. Uh, this re represents the first Jewish soldier who was killed in the Revolutionary War. All right, so I mentioned that I, mentioned that I went to the Naval Academy. And that's where I was commissioned from. And the mission of the Naval Academy is to develop midshipmen morally, mentally, and physically to become officers in the Navy and the Marine Corps. So the physically part dawned on me the second day we were there. Reveille was at 0530, and we had an hour of calisthenics and jogging before breakfast. We marched everywhere. Uh, the mentally part was evident in the strong academic programs. The academies are known for very strong uh, science and, and engineering programs, as well as programs in the humanities. The morally part was a little bit strange. Midshipmen have an honor code that they live by, and midshipmen will not lie, cheat, or steal. And at that time, all midshipmen were required to go to religious services every week. So every Sunday morning was church party. 0800, Catholic services in the chapel. 1000, Protestant services in the chapel. And you see the, the chapel dome on the right. Uh, it's an iconic building at the Naval Academy, and, and the one below that you can see large number of pews that can fit almost the entire brigade of midshipmen in for church services. So I started, my class started with about 1,400 people and about 30 of us were Jewish. And we also had to go to church party on Sunday morning. Uh, the academy did give us a little bit of leeway about where we would go. And so we got invited to go to the synagogue in Annapolis. So in Annapolis at the time, there was one synagogue. It was very, very orthodox. Uh, by orthodox, I mean the men sat in the middle, the women sat on the sides with screens so that they weren't apparent for each other. All the service was in Hebrew. I grew up as a Reformed Jew, and that was a little bit strange to me. But it was the most warm and welcoming place that we'd ever seen. Every Jewish midshipman had a host family, so we had a place to go for a Seder or break the fast or whatever occasion there was. Every Sunday morning, people from the synagogue would come drive us to the synagogue, that was our church party. We'd have a short morning service, and then we'd enjoy coffee and cake and bagels and just relax. It was kind of a place to decompress a little bit from the rigorous military aspects we went through at the Naval Academy. So at the Naval Academy, first year students, the freshmen, they're called plebes. So I was a plebe, and late that summer I got a letter from home and my mother said, Rosh Hashanah's on a weekend this year. Can you come home for services? And I thought, well, I don't know if that's possible or not. I mean, I just got here. I don't really know the ropes. So I went to my squad leader. So the squad leader was a senior. We call him first class. And I, I reported to his room and said, sir, my mother has requested I come home for services. <laughs> that's the reaction I got, too. He laughed at me. <laughs> 
And he said, you want to go home for services? We, we first class only get one week in a semester to go on, on out of the Naval Academy. So he said, it's, it's not going to happen. But he showed me how to fill out the special request form, and he took it to the company officer, and the company officer was the one that was responsible for approving it. So a few days later, my squad leader comes to my room and said, Midshipman Goldberg, I don't know how you did this, but your request was approved. So here I am, a plebe, and I got a weekend off to go to Rosh Hashanah services at home. So that Friday, my dad picked me up, drove me back home, and it was a wonderful time. Um, I, was, I went to services in my dress whites. So by dress whites, it's the, the high collar whites, gold buttons down the side. I had a single national defense ribbon on. I was a plebe. My shoulder boards were flat black with nothing but an anchor. I didn't have a stripe. But think Richard Gere. I mean, it was like, you, you dress a person in a full dress uniform, all right, okay. And my congregation, there could have been an unpopular war on, but they were just so proud of me, as were my folks. So that Sunday, my dad drove me back. I got back into the grind. And a few days late, later, my squad leader comes back to my room and said, Midshipman Goldberg, your report to the company officer's office. Now, this was terrifying. I mean, this is like, see your life flash before your eyes terrifying for a plea. So I went to my company officer's office. He said, Midshipman Goldberg, have a seat. How was your time at home? I told him it was wonderful to see my family again. It was great to be back with my congregation again. And he said, well, it must have been. He's holding this piece of paper. Because your mother wrote a letter to the superintendent <laughs> saying how wonderful it was that we sent you home. <laughs> so that letter went from the superintendent, who's a vice admiral in the U.S. Navy, to the commandant of midshipman, who was a Marine Corps colonel, to the battalion officer, who was a Navy commander, to my company officer, who was lieutenant. And somewhere on there, somebody had written in bright red letters, plebe, question mark, you know. So um, he said, you're not in trouble. We didn't break any rules, but we did bend them a little bit. So there's sort of a lesson here. If you're going to bend the rules, maybe it's best not to advertise it. Let's see if we can just keep this low key from here on out. Okay. So I, I left his office and I understood two rules. One was about bending rules, and the other we learn in the military eventually it's shit flows downhill. Okay. <laughs> so in 1972, uh, something changed at the Naval Academy. If you walk on any college campus then or now, you're going to see students holding signs, protesting something, uh, talking about whatever cause they're interested in. It's hard to find a rebel at the Naval Academy. It's just not in our DNA. But there were a group of seniors at the time who did have a little bit of a, a streak in them, and they didn't think it was right that they had to go to church party on Sunday. And with the assistance of the American Civil Liberties Union, they took the Naval Academy to court, and a federal judge ruled that it was a violation of the Constitution to require midshipmen to attend church services. And just like that, Sunday church party was gone. It was no more. So a lot of midshipmen still went to church. Uh, a lot of midshipmen slept in and made Sunday a lazy day. In almost every case, the Jewish midshipmen, we continued to go out to the synagogue. We had made such close friends there, and it was such a good deal. Take us out, out of the gates and have a good time for a couple of hours before we got back to the work week. The next major change for Jewish midshipmen came in 2005, and this was well past when I was gone. But in 2005, they opened the Commodore Levy Chapel on the grounds of the Naval Academy. You see the building on the lower left and inside. They have a 400-seat synagogue. There's a fellowship room, uh, some offices and uh, classrooms. And so now the Jewish midshipmen at the Naval Academy have a place to go. Uh, they don't go out to, this, out to the, the various um, synagogues. So I was commissioned in 1973, and in my career I served on five different submarines. And in every case, I was the only Jew on board the submarine. So it's interesting, you know, what do you do when you're the only Jewish person on board? Uh, it's hard to 
have a service. You definitely can't have a minion of 10 people if that's what you're trying to accomplish. So I would try to find a little bit of time myself during the week and maybe think about something Jewish. Um, life on a, on a Navy submarine and probably every ship is just very busy. Uh, you're always having watch standing duties, training, doing casualty drills, uh, studying for your next rank. Uh, you rarely have enough time to even eat, sleep, and have a little bit of recreation. So going to religious services isn't really high on the list. But occasionally, I always took a prayer book with me when I went to sea, and I would try to do some reading. Um, sometimes I would just kind of take a few min minutes and think about what my family was doing. Uh, you can't really have your own Jewish holiday on a submarine and take time off, but it would kind of be meaningful to me to think of what my family was doing for the holiday, and I would kind of think, well, they're observing it for me while I'm out here doing whatever I'm, it was that I'm doing. So there's two Jewish holiday stories on my ships that I'll tell you, and these are sea stories, as I call them. So sea stories are a Navy term about something interesting that happened to you that probably didn't happen to anybody else and may have some embellishment to it. And if you're an aviator, it always starts like this. I was at 15,000 feet, but, you know, that's a different story. So this was Passover on my first ship, uh, the USS Flying Fish. And at dinner one night, the executive officer brings this big box down. He said, Lieutenant Goldberg, this has your name on it. And so I didn't know what it was, but there was an organization that I had never heard of before, the Jewish War Veterans, and they had gone around the piers and asked, do you have any Jewish sailors on your ship? And the XO said, yeah, we have one. And so they gave me a Passover kit. So the Passover kit, we opened it, had a box of matzah, a jar of gefilte fish, some kosher for Passover macaroons, a Haggadah, a little bottle of Manischewitz wine, and none of the other officers had heard of Passover, knew anything about it. So we had our little mini Seder there at dinner that night. Um, and everybody kind of shared whatever was in there, except the XO took the bottle of wine, because you're not allowed to have alcohol on a board Navy ship, of course. So that was my interesting Passover story that uh, everybody remembered that for a while. And so the second holiday story I'll tell you about is one Yom Kippur. It's about a year later, and I was a weapons officer still on the Flying Fish. And a couple of my sailors, were well, actually like 10 of my sailors in my department, had gotten into trouble. They had gone to a party that was put on by one of, our, one of their shipmates and passed around marijuana. So the Navy, this was 1975, and the Navy was cracking down on drug use, uh, and it was a serious offense. If they were found that they actually had used marijuana, uh, they could be reduced in rate, they could be fined, they could be disqualified from submarine service, they could be kicked out of the Navy. So all of these sailors were we call put on report, they were accused of potentially violating the Uniform Code of Military Justice, which is the rules that we all live by in the military. And when you're put on report for that, you go to a hearing on, the sh on a Navy ship, it's called Captain's Mast. So captain's mast is a very formal hearing. Uh, the captain's sitting at the table. The accused comes in and stands in front of him. He's read his rights. The captain tells him what he's accused of, um, reviews the evidence, and asks the sailor, what do you have to say for yourself? And whether he wants to or not, the sailor has a chance to speak directly to the captain. But the captain also asks his supervisor, which is usually chief petty officer, chief, what can you tell me about petty officer Smith's performance? And then I'll ask the same question to the department head, which was me. I was the weapons officer. So it was a long day. We started, there were about 20 or so masks, and I had about 10 of them to go to. Um, and started in the morning, went all morning, we took a short break for lunch, went all afternoon. And did I mention this was Yom Kippur? Yeah. So when it was all over, uh, this grueling day, I had lost about nine out of the ten of those sailors, so roughly a third of my department was no longer with us. So that was bad. So I went to the XO, and I said, now that it's all over, uh, do you mind if I leave? It's Yom Kippur today, and I was going to see if I could get, this, get the services and maybe uh, get there in time for the concluding services. Yom Kippur, you didn't tell me. If you told me, I would have given you the day off. And I don't, I don't remember if I said anything to him, but, you know, I didn't want the day off. My job was to be there. I was supposed to support my sailors. Um, and it was just a lesson that 
It didn't matter if I was Jewish on Yom Kippur, if you're Catholic on Easter, when the military requires you to do something, that, that takes the priority over, over uh, going to the services. So I had, there are plenty of times that I was able to get off and go to services, but this was not one of them. So a few years later, uh, I was the chief engineer on my second ship, the USS Memphis, and we were deployed to the Mediterranean. We pulled into uh, a base we have in Sardinia. We were going to do about three weeks of a refit period. And this was a time that uh, Susie was pregnant with her first child. She was about two or so weeks overdue. So the captain gave me leave so I could fly home to be with the family. So I flew home through a very circuitous, circuitous route. And I got there about 12 hours after Ross was born. So. It was good intentions, but you know what they say in the Navy, you have to be there for the laying of the keel, you don't have to be there for the launching of the ship, right? Get it? Get it? Okay. <laughs> so, um, and I still hear about it to this day because, you know, just getting there from this remote place in Sardinia to Norfolk, Virginia, over about 48 hours, cost me somewhere around $2,000 in airplane fees. And if you put that into your phone right now, that's like $12,000 in today's dollars. So it was a pretty big chunk of money, and you know, but I was there. And I had about 10 days before I had to head back to the ship. And it was a whirlwind of bringing Susie and the baby back, setting up a nursery, um, getting the family organized. And, and my dad asked me, well, what, what are you doing about a bris? So a bris is the ceremony that you have for a baby boy where you do the circumcision. So I didn't have any experience with this, and we weren't members of a synagogue yet, so I didn't have a rabbi, so I started my search for a rabbi. Fortunately, the Norfolk Naval Base, which is the largest U.S. base uh, that we have, has a large chapel, and they had a whole bunch of chaplains on, on uh, duty there. And so I made an appointment to see the Jewish chaplain, who was a, a rabbi, and met with him. Didn't go particularly well. I said, Rabbi... We just, just had, a, our son was born, and we'd like to have a bris. Would you, would you officiate at the bris? And he said, well, have you arranged for a moil? So a moil is the individual that actually does the circumcision. And I explained to the rabbi, well, rabbi, we're reform, and we had the obstetrician take care of the circumcision in the hospital, and we just want this to be a symbolic gathering of our family. So then the rabbi explained to me that he was an Orthodox rabbi, and he was going to have no part in just some symbolism, and I'd have to go somewhere else. So what are you going to do? Well, today, um, and I did this, he put bris ceremony into a Google search box, and man, you get all kinds of things come up. I could have printed out my own uh, service. I could have ordered from Amazon, and 20 of them would be there for tomorrow. But this was 1979. We didn't have the Internet. We didn't have home computers. We didn't have cell phones. But fortunately, my dad was able to get copies of a booklet uh, from his synagogue, bring them, and we had our own ceremony in the house, just like ancient days. So that worked out pretty good. So I didn't have much success with that chaplain, but I have had good success with chaplains overall. Chaplains are a very important part of our military. Uh, you probably heard the phrase, there are no atheists in foxholes. And what that means is just about everything that the military does is dangerous in one way or another, whether it's wartime or peacetime. And sailors and soldiers rely on their faith a lot of times to, to face these challenges. And sometimes they need help in, in developing that faith. And so that's what chaplains are for. So I, now I was the commanding officer of the Newport News. Uh, you see there on the, on the right. And we were, we were part of Submarine Squadron 8. So a submarine squadron has eight to ten submarines. Usually the repair tender is with them. Uh, they have a staff that helps us with operations and uh, logistics and things like that. And they have a chaplain, one chaplain to serve all the, all the men and women in the squadron. So the chaplain is new to the squadron, fresh out of divinity school, went to OCS, became a lieutenant. And he was a Protestant minister. And he had all the quintessential qualities that you'd think of uh, for a rabbi, a chaplain, a, a priest, a minister. He was intelligent, intelligent social, sociable, empathetic to the needs of his, their flock. 
So he came down to the ship one day and said, Captain, can I talk to you? It's about Petty Officer Smith. So this was a new Petty Officer that we had on board, been with us about six months. He said, Petty Officer Smith has come to me, and you're working him really hard. You've given him a, a qualification schedule that he's supposed to meet. He's supposed to be qualified in submarines in 12 months. You're getting ready for deployment. You know, he's under a lot of stress. I think you should give him a lighter load because he, he's not dealing with it too well. So I thanked the chaplain and took it under advisement. You know, this was not something we had never heard of before. Um, if you look at all the submarines in the Navy, there are hundreds of new petty officers that come down every year that face the same things. Yeah, they have to qualify for submarines in a year. Yeah, they have to qualify on their watch stations. It's, it's a hard job. But we're there to make sure that those people succeed. By the time a sailor gets to me on the ship, the Navy's already put in thousands and thousands of dollars of training and advanced education. We're not going to waste that. We're not going to let the guy just, just flounder and, and, and not succeed. So I talked to the, the Petty Officer Smith's chief petty officer, and we put a plan together. And sure enough, he came around, and sometime during our deployment, he qualified in submarines. And it was a proud day when we pinned his dolphins on him. So we come back from deployment. Every time you come back, a certain number of sailors leave. You get new sailors on board. And so a few months later, I get a call from the chaplain again. He'd like to come down and see me. I said, oh, no, not this again. So the chaplain comes down and says, Captain, I need to talk to you about Petty Officer Jones. He doesn't understand. He's got to work hard to meet the goals that you've set for him. He's a malingerer. You need to get his chief to light a fire under his ass. I was like, oh, okay, chaplain. Okay, okay. Got it, chaplain. Yes, yes, we'll deal with that. Okay. So I think in the year from where he came on board to where he was now, he had a much better understanding of what submariners do and what's required of people and how they can meet those challenges. And he was probably a soft shoulder to cry on a few times more and got burned on it. So we kind of learned that lesson. So he was, he was a big help to us. So I'm glad that we had people like that to, to work with us. So one of the burning questions people have for me when they hear about my career and what I did is, did you ever have any discrimination or anti-Semitism uh, in that, that you noticed in your career? And I always answer, as truthfully as I can, no, I don't remember any. So one thing, submarines may be a little bit unique. Uh, we, uh, the submarine ethos is kind of what happened from World War II on. And in World War II, uh, a submarine had a crew of about 55. And they went on, went on some of the most dangerous missions in the war. And they had to rely on everybody. And even though our submarines are bigger and our crews are bigger, a crew of submarines about 120, 130, they still have dangerous missions. And I've served with sailors of every race, every ethnic origin uh, that you can conceive of. And all you care about is can that person do their job? When the chips are down, do they know how to stop a flooding, how to put out a fire, how to do this? And they just don't have time for prejudice. Um, you heard a brief uh, uh, summary of my career. The Navy made me commanding officer three times, two submarines and a shore command. Uh, my shore assignments were like the best you could ask for. I was on the personal staff of the Chief of Naval Operations, and I was the senior military assistant to the Assistant Secretary of Defense. If there was discrimination going on because I was Jewish, I don't think I would have gotten any of those jobs. So that's pretty much how I see it. So I did say I would talk about some other Jewish people who had made an impact in the Navy. And I, I called this talk Jews in the military, but the three individuals I'm going to talk about are all in the Navy. And you can criticize me for that later. <laughs> it's not that there aren't really great Jewish people that were made a difference in the Army, Navy, or Marine Corps, or Coast Guard, or now the Space Force. Uh, but Commodore Levy was uh, an active duty officer in the Barbary Wars and the War of 1812. He became the first Navy's Commodore, and that was the most senior admiral in the Navy. So today it would be like the, the four-star admiral in charge. 
and he and he was Jewish. He did a lot of things operationally, and one of the things that he did was he worked to abolish the practice of flogging. So today it's captain's mast, then it was 20 lashes before the mast. Okay, so that was one of the important functions that he did was to change the whole punishment structure so that it was not physical punishment. He was also a real estate uh, and philanthropist, and when Thomas Jefferson died, he bought his house at Monticello, had it fixed up, and that got donated to the American people. So historically, uh, Commodore Levy did experience a lot of anti-Semitism, and apparently he had a short temper, and any time that he perceived that what somebody said to him was a slight, he would get into a fight. And Commodore Levy was court-martialed six times, <laughs> but still somehow he made it to the top. Don't know how, but it's good that he did. Uh, he's buried in a Jewish cemetery in New York, and the chapel at Norfolk Naval Station and the chapel at the Naval Academy are both named in his honor. So the next, the next person I want to talk about is Admiral Hyman G. Rickover, who some of you have heard about. He's known as the father of the nuclear navy. He was actually born in Poland, and his family came to the United States in 1905 to escape the pogroms. He was a bright student, uh, shined in high school, and he received an appointment to the Naval Academy in 1918. There's not a lot of factual material I've seen written about him, but our historical recollection, recollection was he had a really difficult time at the Naval Academy because not only was he Jewish, um, he was kind of an academic type, uh, and he had sort of a quirky personality, which kind of came out a little bit later in his life. So once he was commissioned, uh, Admiral Rickover served in a number of different kinds of ships, served on a battleship, submarine, minesweeper. Uh, along the way, he got a uh, mechanical en or electrical engineering degree, um, a master's degree from Columbia University, and he started to specialize in uh, naval engineering types of things. He was a commander in World War II, and his function was to oversee the repair of ships that were damaged in battle. So after the war, he was assigned to the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And what the laboratory did was they were starting to do research on nuclear reactors for power generation and other things. So Admiral Rickover got the idea and he championed it about using nuclear reactors to power ships and submarines. Uh, and he fought tenaciously to get this through. So the Navy has not been known for its forward thinking throughout the years, put it that way. Uh, he met a lot of resistance from the senior admirals. And the story is that he barged into the office of the Chief of Naval Operations, who happened to be uh, Fleet Admiral Chester Nimitz, and explained this whole process about why it's so important to put a nuclear reactor on a submarine. And Nimitz had been a submariner at one time, and he instantly saw the value of this. And that's how the Naval Reactors Program got started. So Admiral Rickover served as the head of naval reactors until 1982. He was the longest serving admiral ever in the Navy. So there are laws that allow you so many years of service and then you're required to retire. So basically every year Congress had to pass a law that authorized Admiral Rickover another year, another year, another year. And he was the head of that organization for a long time. So he kept very strict control over the entire naval reactors program. And he did that because he wanted to be high quality, very safe. We've, we've, of all these years from the 1950s that we've been operating submarines, we've never had a reactor accident. Uh, and he personally interviewed every officer that was accepted into the, the nuclear program. So it was in his waning years, but I was one of those lucky midshipmen to have the pleasure of going into Admiral Rickover's office for my interview. So I guess I could say it was very stressful. There are hundreds of stories that midshipmen have about, oh, this went on when I met with Admiral Rickover. And they're probably all true, I think, everyone. So I got kicked out of his office three times. <laughs> I had to keep coming back and giving another answer about what I was going to do and how I was going to finish. And uh, really, all he was trying to do uh, that I see later was to motivate me to be the best that I could be and not just rest on my laurels and say, 
Yeah, I got into the program. Look at me. So there are, uh, there was a ship, a submarine named after Admiral Rickover, a Los Angeles class ship, and that's since been retired. And there's a new ship being built, a Virginia class submarine that will bear his name when it finally gets commissioned. Uh, Admiral Mike Borda was the chief of naval operations, and his story is um, both fascinating and tragic. So he started in his Navy career in 1956. He dropped out of high school and enlisted. Uh, but the Navy helped him turn his life around, and he finished high school in the Navy, got a GED, um, became, he was a personnel man, and uh, a few years later, he was selected for officer candidate school. And after his commissioning in officer candidate school, he served in the surface Navy, and this was all during the Vietnam War, and his career took off from there. In 1994, he became the chief of naval operations. Uh, this is the most senior admiral in the Navy, and uh, it bears distinction for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, he's the only Jewish CNO, he was the only CNO to start life as an enlisted man, and he was also the only CNO up until that time that had not been a Naval Academy graduate. So it was a very spectacular career up to that point. So the problem came in with um, a, something that happened uh, over the course of his service as CNO. So throughout his career, you, you see the, the ribbons on, on his uniform. So there were two ribbons that he had gotten in Vietnam, and he wore them with, it's a bronze V, it's the combat distinguishing device. So if you earn a particular ribbon under combat situations, you're authorized to wear it with that V on there. And he had done that for two of them. So while he was the chief of naval operations, it was pointed out that the official record did not support that. Uh, the official record being you are awarded the bronze star with combat distinguishing device. If it doesn't say that, you didn't earn it, even though he thought he was because it had come from a combat zone and all. Um, kind of a minor thing, you know, it got corrected, and for a year later he, he wore it with, correctly without the, the V on there. But there was a reporter that hounded him mercilessly, mercilessly uh, about wearing that device. And the reporter, his whole thing was, it's called Stolen Valor. It's where you wear a medal or some award that you're not authorized. And to most of us, it would have been just a minor thing, and we would have corrected and gone about our day. But to Admiral Borda, he was distraught. He thought he was letting down the sailors who he loved and was leading them ever since he was an E-1 enlisting in the Navy. And what happened was he went to his quarters one day at the... Um, at the, at the Navy base and killed himself, suicide. So it was a sad ending to an otherwise illustrious career. So I could talk for many hours, probably days, uh, about many of the other individuals uh, who have contributed things. And here's just a short list that I put together, okay, so you have an idea. So Haim Solomon was not a military man, but he was probably the most important man in the American Revolution. So today, sailors and soldiers and Marines, we get a paycheck, it comes from the government. Way back when, if you went to war, the general resp was responsible for recruiting his army and paying them. Well, George Washington was a wealthy man, but he wasn't that wealthy that he could pay everyone in the Continental Army. So Haim Solomon was his fundraiser that raised the funds so he could actually pay the Army. Major General Rose was in charge of the 3rd Armored Division. He was killed in action. Uh, he was the, in Europe, he was the most senior officer killed in World War II, a, a Jewish, Jewish general. So some of you have heard the story about the four chaplains. Uh, the USS Dorchester was torpedoed in 1943, 
And there were four army chaplains on board. Uh, Alexander Good was one of them. He was a rabbi. And the four chaplains gave their life vests to other soldiers to save themselves, and, and they perished in the, in the sinking. Uh, Frances Slanger was an army nurse. She had been born in Europe and had escaped to the United States, enlisted, and she happened to be the only army nurse killed in action in World War II. Uh, those next four names, Einstein, Zilzard, Oppenheimer, and Teller were not military people, but they were the, the key scientists that were involved in the Manhattan Project, the development of the, the nuclear bomb that ended World War II. You may recognize some of these modern secretaries of defense who are all Jewish, uh, James Schlesinger, Harold Brown, William Cohen, Henry Kissinger, you know, Secretary of State, and John Deutsch was a director of the CIA. And there are probably many, many that you all know about that you could, you could share too. So that's my little spiel about what it was like for me being in the, in the Navy as a Jew. Um, if you had any questions, you know, I could, I'd be happy to answer anything that you have. Sure. How do you get into submarines? How do you get into submarines? Okay, so, um, yeah, people, getting into submarines is very special, and, and people think that, well, there's a, a raft of things that you have to do to get there. Actually, all you have to do is volunteer, okay? <laughs> So there's no psychological testing. Uh, there's nothing like that. There are some, uh, if you're physically qualified for the Navy and volunteer, you do go through some extra physical screening. And that's only because there's some things it's okay to be in the Navy about with, but not okay for submarines. An example, if you've ever had a history of kidney stones, it's, it's disqualifying from submarines. And the reason is you can be on a surface ship, it's just that, if you have had kidney stones and you would develop another one, submarines are out there with no support, no doctor or anything. On a surface ship, they could get you to medical help right away. But So certain things like that might be disqualifying. But for the most part, there's nothing special other than you're a volunteer and you can go. Okay, the, what was the longest time I was underwater? So the longest time submerged... To, to surfacing was 75 days. It was on a ballistic missile patrol, and we left Bangor, Washington, came back to Bangor, Washington. Never saw anything, didn't surface the entire time. Um, the longest I was ever away was six and a half months. Uh, that was a deployment uh, to the Mediterranean and the Indian Ocean. But we would be gone for several weeks or a month, and then we'd pull in to resupply uh, and then we'd go out again for another operations. Maybe they would take us to a Liberty port for a couple of days. Um, so it was a different set of operations. So the limiting factor on how long you can st actually stay submerged is how much food do you have on board. And the limiting factor on how long you can be away without coming into port is really how much food you have on board. The, the, the submarine is a technological marvel. We have machines on board that produce oxygen, machines on board that remove carbon dioxide and other trace gases. So atmospherically, you can, you can survive for a long time. As long as you have food, you can, you can stay, stay and do your job. Okay, so the, uh, the squadron designations on naval aircraft, um, they're, like for a submarine, it was submarine squadron eight. For a aircraft squadron, it would be VF-20, fighter squadron 20, or uh, VP-3, which was the patrol craft. So the V is just a designation for this is an aircraft squadron for the Navy and the letter that follows it kind of tells us what kind of squadron it is. Go ahead, ask. I'll repeat it for you. Yeah. Uh, our daughter was in the uh, med in the time lake for about 10 years. She was a machinist mate in the Navy. Just wonder if that was the, your tender for your squadron. 
Okay, that's a good question. So the Simon Lake is a submarine tender, and <laughs> submarine tenders are large repair ships. They have cranes, they have machine shops, uh, they have everything you need. A submarine comes in and berths alongside, and we give them the work list, and they have sailors that come down and help us do the repairs and, and fix things. Um, at the time when Simon Lake was around, the uh, Navy had a base in Sardinia. It was actually a NATO base, but this, the tenders were there. When I pulled in, it was the USS Emory S. Land was a submarine tender, so a sister ship to the Simon Lake. Uh, I don't know that for a fact, but I do think he was unpopular at the Naval Academy. You're right, you're right. Yeah. Do you think going forward, uh, submarines might be more influential, perhaps more important than perhaps a destroyer or things of that sort? So, okay, so the question is, uh, do I th how do submarines um, stack up against destroyers and other things like that? So the, the missions are kind of kind of different. Um, we, we need submarines and we need destroyers. And there are things that submarines can do that destroyers can't. And there are things that destroyers can do that submarines can't. So destroyers have anti-aircraft missiles, so they can shoot down enemy planes and all. Submarine doesn't have anything like that. Destroyers and submarines, we both carry Tomahawk missiles, so we can do land attack. Um, one of the values of submarines are that they are completely stealthy. They are so quiet. Uh, we used to say that the amount of acoustic energy that a submarine puts out is less than a 100-watt light bulb. And that was 20 years ago, so I think it's more like an LED bulb now. Uh, so they're very quiet. And think about it from the president's standpoint. You know, if, if there's a crisis somewhere, we can send a submarine in. They're submerged. Nobody knows they're there. If the crisis resolves, bring them, bring them home. Nobody has to know that we were there. You put an aircraft carrier 20 miles off of the coast of something, everybody knows it's there. And if we have to bring that back, you know, now it's like, oh, we forced that carrier back, you know, that kind of thing. So there is some value to the submarines in, in that standpoint. Um, Technology is advancing, but it's still mighty difficult to find a submarine that's submerged. And you read a lot now about, you know, what would happen if there was a war in the Pacific and just like World War II, uh, the submarines would be a major part of that uh, because everything in the Pacific is maritime. And you can't go anywhere that a submarine doesn't hear you and have the ability to sink a ship. What's the armament on a submarine? What's the armament on a submarine? Um, say, we have two basic kinds of submarines, the ballistic missile submarines and the attack submarines. So the, the main armament of the ballistic missile submarine is the intercontinental ballistic missiles that we would need to keep a nuclear deterrent. But they also carry torpedoes for self-defense, and if needed, they could be they could go on the on the attack. The uh, armament on an attack submarine is flexible. They always carry torpedoes for self-defense and to sink other ships. They carry tomahawk missiles for land attack. Uh, they can carry harpoon missiles for anti-ship attack. They can lay mines. Uh, so depending on what you need the submarine to do, they, you don't load it that way all the time. If you're going on a mining mission, you might carry four torpedoes and a whole bunch of mines. Uh, but generally, there's some kind of mix of that uh, capability. Do you know anything about the current status of, uh, of Jews in the military, Jews in the Navy, Jews in, the, in general? Um, the current status of Jews in the, in the military, um, I don't think it's any different than when I left. Uh, I think that people are, um, the military people are judged by their performance, uh, not by their background or orientation or anything like that. So I, I won't expect there's a problem right now.
while you were in the service. Um, regarding anti-Semitism, do you feel today, with anti-Semitism being as out of control as it is, that it's still out of the military? That there isn't any, it's as limited like it was in your day? Well, that's, that's tough to answer. The question is, you know, what is the status of anti-Semitism in the military? And um, I'm only be able to give you something hearsay from the past couple of years. Uh, I haven't talked specifically to anybody who's there, but it just seems to me that's, of all the personnel problems that the military has, anti-Semitism isn't, isn't one. The biggest problem I see that the military has right now is recruiting something like 60 or 70 percent of young people in the country don't meet the standards for, for enlisting. You know, that's a problem, uh, both the physical, uh, academic, things like that. You know, so it's not like they won't take somebody who's Jewish. It's they can't take somebody because they're way overweight or they can't do the basic physical requirements. Mark, uh, what's your impression of the technical aspects in the hunt from Red October, that maneuvering and all that stuff? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, people ask me that a lot. What's 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 real with the hunt for Red October? And, and I always say 50% of it is real life, okay? So uh, there are some things that are completely Hollywood in it. You know, when, when the ship was maneuvering between the, mount, the sea mountains and all to escape the torpedoes, I mean, those sea mountains are way, way down there. We'd, we would not go that deep in the first place. Um, and then uh, the Red October, which was the Russian submarine, had this caterpillar drive, which was this quiet magneto hydrodynamic thing when they were going real slow. And ships aren't, you can do magneto hydro, hydrodynamics, but the ships aren't big enough to have both a nuclear reactor powered plant and a hydrodynamic power plant. Uh, so that part's all kind of kind of wrong. What percentage of women serve on submarines at this point? Okay, what percentage of women serve on submarines? Okay, I don't have an exact number of that. So uh, what we have started, this was, I guess it's been probably 15 years. Uh, they started putting, they started with four women. They were supply officers, so they weren't line officers. And they were put on um, four of the ballistic missile submarines. Uh, we then expanded that to additional women we then had, have women who are nuclear trained officers on board submarines, and now we have women who are nuclear trained enlisted personnel on submarines. And so it's a slow go, but uh, there's still privacy issues. The ballistic missile submarines are easier than the attack submarines. Basically, on an attack submarine, you have 50 bunks in this room, 50 bunks in this room, and the common showers and bathrooms in between. Uh, not much room for privacy at all. On the ballistic missile submarines, the bunking arrangements are between the missile tubes. They built small nine-person cubes, and so you can you can have women on and have a little bit more semblance of privacy than just showering with the men. Why would a submarine? plant mines. Okay, why would a submarine plant mines? All right, so if you were at war with somebody and you wanted to de deny them the use of a port, for, for example, um, you would lay mines and you'd tell your enemy your, your sea lanes are mine. So if they send a ship out, it could possibly get blown up by a naval mine. Okay, so how do you get those mines to where they're going to go? There's a couple of ways. One, a submarine can deliver them, um, a ship can deliver them, or an aircraft can deliver them. But if you're mining a, an enemy's harbor close to where they are, they're going to shoot down your airplane, they're going to sink your ship, but they're not going to know the submarine came in and, and planted them there. So it's just one of many submarine capabilities is to lay mines. And the reason you would do it is some part of a war plan that would deny port access to your enemy.
So the, the question is, uh, could we send a submarine through narrow passages to operate? And the example was through the Dardanelles into the Black Sea. Uh, so the answer to that is uh, yes. Um, we practice precise navigation. If it were peacetime and you're just going from here to there, you'll probably do the safest route that there is. If it were wartime and you needed a submarine to get someplace, they're prepared to go through those routes. Uh, Gibraltar, for example, we, we commonly go submerged through the Gibraltar. Now, it's not quite as narrow as the Dardanelles, but uh, we, we practice doing those kind of things. Are our submarines better than the Russians and Chinese submarines? Okay, our, are our submarines better, superior to Russian and um, Chinese submarines? And the answer is yes. Uh, not that they're not far behind us. What, uh, for a while, the, the Soviets were always a generation behind us, and they started to get pretty good. But then when the Soviet Union broke up and Russia had to deal with all that themselves, what makes a submarine good is a lot of things. And part of it is the initial design where you're putting technology to work and what your systems are. But you have to maintain those systems. Um, and it takes a lot of work to make sure that they remain that way. And so the Russian Navy kind of sunk into disrepair, not sinking literally into the water, but uh, descended in their quality because they didn't have the money to continually put forth through it. Uh, Chinese have been building their fleet. They're not as good as the United States is yet, but they could be at some someday. How thick is the hull of a submarine? Uh, I would guess in round numbers, something like three inches. I, I don't know the exact, the exact amount. Uh, but it's a special steel, um, and the steel that they use has to be certified by laboratories before they make the, the rings, and then they weld them together, and all those welds get tested. And it's kind of a trade-off. Uh, whatever thickness of the hull that you have, that withstands a certain pressure. And so as the submarine goes deeper, the pressure increases, and the hull withstands that pressure. If you want it to go deeper, you need a thicker hull, but then you have less room for other stuff. So it's a kind of a trade-off of, do you need it to go deeper and be less capable, or can I make it a little bit shallower and put more torpedoes in it? Were you in a combat situation where your submarine was uh, badly damaged? Um, okay. Was I in a combat situation where my submarine was badly damaged? No. Fortunately, I, my submarine was never badly damaged. I wouldn't be here today <laughs> if it were. But I was in a combat situation, so we participated in Operation Desert Storm. Um, this was the, the war that we kicked... Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait, the first one, okay? So I was the captain of the Newport News at the time, and we were out in Norfolk, uh, off of Norfolk, doing training operations, and we got a flash message. So flash is like the highest priority of messages, and I can't remember ever getting a flash message. It said, return to port immediately. So we, we got back into port. We pulled in about uh, 8 o'clock in the morning, and there on the pier was 20 Tomahawk missiles, 90 days worth of food, all the supplies we could want. We loaded up, and the next morning we were gone. And so that was, that was how quick it was. Dan? Yes, we, that's part of the related to atmospheric control. We have our distilling plant, uh, which will distill roughly 10,000 gallons per day of water, and we have pure water holding tanks. And so compared to uh, the World War II submarines, it is luxurious on a nuclear submarine. So on a nuclear submarine, because the nuclear reactor, we have continuous generation of electrical power. So we have air conditioning, uh, and we need the air conditioning because we have all these computers on board. We need to keep it cool. So most of the time, you're walking around with a sweater. It's so cool. Uh, but we can take a shower every day. 
Now, we can't take, we call them Hollywood showers. You can't just sit there and let the water run off your back. But you can take a shower out every day. On a diesel submarine, when you went to war, you didn't take a shower until you got home. And you, and you smelled like it. A frightening moment from my past. Um, okay, so uh, when I was a weapons officer on Flying Fish, one of our missions was to go under ice to the Arctic. Uh, we surfaced at the North Pole, and we spent 60 days doing surveillance under the Arctic ice cap. So we have some special sonar systems that help us avoid uh, icebergs and ice keels and things like that. And we're going along, and boom, the whole system went down. So that was scary. Not because I thought we were going to die in an instant. It was because I wasn't sure how we were going to fix it yet. And if we didn't fix it, how we were going to get out of there. But we did fix it. Mark, uh, I've already heard the story, but you might want to share it with this group. And that is uh, performing under the ice and uh, how you keep track of where you are how you get through the ice, if you have okay. a need to do that. Okay, all right, that. yeah. Um, and the question is, you know, how does a, how does a submarine do things under the ice? Uh, I did give a presentation to the Tech Matters Club a while back uh, on under ice, under operations. But basically, as you know, the Arctic is iced over, but it's really an ocean. So when you're under the ice, you're just in water just like you were out in the Atlantic Ocean. You just have ice on top. So the things you have to worry about is making sure you don't run into any ice keels that might be down there. So you have special sonar systems that help you navigate that. And occasionally, you might want to come up to get radio communication. And so we find some relatively thin layers of ice we can surface a submarine up to through three feet thick, so anything from open water to three feet thick. And I didn't bring any pictures of that to show you, but basically you find your feature, you hover the submarine right underneath it, and you make the submarine positively buoyant so it starts to come up, and when it hits the ice, ice isn't real, um, real strong until it breaks it and the, and the submarine surfaces through that ice. So we can do that, and then you can raise your radio antennas and get radio traffic and communications. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank everybody on behalf of the Shalom Club and the Veterans Club and Mark for doing a fabulous presentation. Please make sure you go to the back of the room and take part in some of the wonderful refreshments that are back there. Don't make us have to bring the stuff back home.